And we'll Thank get you. started. Yeah, you should be able to share now. Let me try it. There we go. Okay. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Great. So let's start, shall we? So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ying. I am a cardiology registrar and a NIHR clinical lecturer. I'm currently working in the Northwest uh, as a clinical lecturer in cardiology um, in Aero Park Hospital. So uh, I really thank the uh, host of the Medicine the Essentials to invite me to have this talk today. Um, so today we'll be talking basically about cardiac emergencies. Um, so uh, obviously subscribe to Medicine Essentials on the YouTube channel. And obviously this talk is recorded and hopefully anyone that missed it will be able to see it on the YouTube channel at some point. So let's get straight into the content. So today we're gonna to go through a few aspects. So firstly, we're gonna talk about the approach towards cardiac emergencies. And I'm gonna talk about some tachycardia, some bradycardia, chest pains, which are the commonest presentation to most emergency department. And, and then we'll go through some cases and it will, we'll, I'll try and keep it as interactive as possible. So uh, you can learn a lot from it. And lastly, we will have Q and A. So cardiology is fairly straightforward. The things that can go wrong is either is the heart is going too fast, the heart is going too slow. And with regards to your cardiac emergency wise, it's also in the same kind of train of thought is always too slow or too fast most of the time. So let's start with, so how do you approach cardiac emergencies? So as with all your ILS and ALS training, the very first thing is to look for any danger, ensure that it's safe to approach the patient. Um, obviously, because you need to make sure that you are safe before you can treat the patients. Secondly, you need to, once you get to the patient is to assess for response. So assess for any signs of life. So by looking at spontaneous breathing, feeling the pulse of the patient and so on. So once, if there is no signs of life, then put out an arrest call and you can start your ALS algorithm. Otherwise it will be assessments with ABCDE. And I think this was discussed last week. So I'm not gonna go into details of how you assess ABCDE, but I'll focus mainly on the C which is kind of cardiac specific. So the important things that you need to do for C is to look at the heart rate. So checking the heart rate of the patient, seeing whether they're bradycardic or tachycardic will help you identify or at least give some differential as to what may be wrong with the patient. After which, then you can look at the blood pressure because it's a very good sign of how shock or how compromised the patient is. The patient can be very tachycardic, but if they're maintaining a blood pressure, it means that you've got a little bit more time to deal with this. And then obviously as part of the circulation, you need to make sure that you access, get IV access and send the bloods off. Look for any electrolyte disturbances which are quite common that can precipitate arrhythmias and also look for other causes which might be why the patient is presenting with their specific symptoms. And lastly, ECG obviously is the most important thing that we need to have uh, in all cardiology patients or any cardiac emergencies. Initially, it might be just a tree lead ECG, which you can see on this, which is what you can see on a monitor. But if you once you get the chance to make sure that you get a 12 lead because it will give you a lot more information than what you can see on the tree lead ECG. So firstly, we're going to talk about tachycardia. So the definition of tachycardia basically just means that your heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute. So the normal heart rate ranges between 60 to 100. Anytime you go above 100 beats per minute, you are considered tachycardic. And what is very important in a patient who has a heart rate of more than 100 is to ensure that they get they put onto a cardiac monitor or at least get a 12 lead ECG to start with. And then assessing the blood pressure again I said it's very important because it tells you how compromised the patient is and gives you the chance to decide how fast you need to react to each situation. 
And obviously, when you're junior, when you're quite junior in your career, try and get help early. But that doesn't mean not assessing the patient. So start with assessing the patient. Once you have a rough idea of what you think is going on, then get help. So what are the important things I look at when I first see a patient with tachycardia? So the nurse might be bleeping you and calling you and say, oh, can you come assess this patient who is tachycardic? So the very first thing that I would do is either put the patient on a monitor or do a 12 lead ECG because the morphology of the QRS is very, very important when you're trying to decipher what's going on in tachycardia. So it could be someone with a very broad complex, which is QRS duration more than 120 milliseconds. Or if you look at your ECG strip, it should be more than three small boxes. And then, or it could be a narrow complex, which is what we see in here. So tachycardia, but the complex is narrow. This is a very important differentiation because it tells you what to do next and, and, and it gives you a rough idea of what your differentials might be. So I think the, obviously the broad complex is the more scary one that people have to deal with. But also in fact, it's actually the more easy one because there's only a few differentials that could come up with uh, broad complex tachycardia. So basically there's only two. It's either VT or VF, or basically a ventricular arrhythmias, or it could be a supraventricular arrhythmia with aberrant conduction. So these are the two differentials when you see someone with broad complex tachycardia. So most of the time, the safest thing will be to treat the broad complex tachycardia as VT, because more, that is the more dangerous rhythm and that should be something that you deal with quite quickly and appropriately. So getting help if you see a broad complex tachycardia would be one of the first things you should be doing. Uh, as I said, treat SVT in most cases. So the, the different things can make you decide whether this is VT or whether this is a SVT of aberrancy. Uh, things that point towards VT would be the absence of the typical bundle branch block pattern. So I'm sure you guys know your ECG. So you've got your left bundle and right bundle with the marrow and the, and the uh, William kind of morphology. So if you don't have that kind of morphology, it's more likely to be a VT. If you have very, very broad complexes, like more than 150 milliseconds, if there's AV, signs of AV dissociation, which is what you see. So the red one is fusion beads. So you see the sinus bead and the ventricular bead fused together into a weird complex or you can have a capture beat, which you see the broad complexes in the middle, the ventricles capture from the AV node. So it becomes a normal beat that conducts through and then it goes back into your uh, broad complex again. So these two signs are very suspicious of VT. And then obviously, lastly, the, having the age and the medical history is useful. Young patients are less likely to have VT, doesn't mean no, but less likely. And obviously someone with ischemic heart disease or heart failure are more likely to develop VT. So this will help you triage your patient a little bit better. In case of hemodynamic compromise, in the, in the sense that there's no cardiac output, the patient has very severe chest pain and or low blood pressure, cardioversion is the only treatment for broad complex. Otherwise, there will be medications which you can uh, see from the ALS algorithm, which involves amiodarone and different things. But I wouldn't expect foundation year doctors to initiate that without discussion with the registrars. So the other side of the coin would be narrow complex tachycardia. So as explained, this is narrow complex and it's basically it means that the conduction down the ventricles is coming from the top half of the heart. So differentials, there are four big ones. So it's either a sinus tachycardia where you can see sinus beads or P waves before your QRS, or you will have your SVTs, which are your AVNRTs and AVRTs. And then you will have your atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. These are the four common narrow complex tachycardia that most people deal with. 
and this is normally slightly more stable. Obviously, it depends on what type of patient you have and what are the comorbidities, but most of the time, they are more stable. And there was most of the time a underlying cause to it. So sinus tachycardia usually implies that something else is going on with the patient. It could be that the patient has a PE and that's why they're having tachycardia or the patient might be septic or hypovolemic. So always, always when you see sinus tachycardia, look for the underlying cause. Similarly, even age fibrillation, you might see this underlying cause. So thyrotoxicosis is one of the commonest uh, cause that I see that is secondary, that causes secondary AF. Other things might be electrolyte disturbances, which might also cause AF. And then obviously all these things, you need to make sure you treat the underlying cause. And most of the time with narrow complex tachycardia, you can manage with rate limiting medications. Bisoprolol or beta blockers are kind of the first line. Other things for asthmatics, you can try uh, rate limiting calcium channel blockers like verapamil. And then um, other things might be digoxin and so on and so forth. But beta blockers and rate limiting calcium channel blockers are kind of the mainstay. Again, if there are evidence of hemodynamic compromise, there is a need for cardioversion in these patients. Okay, so that's kind of the brief stop of tachycardia, which is fairly straightforward. And it probably is one of the commonest reasons why nurses will be you from wards and also why patients come into hospital getting admitted from ED is, is tachycardia. On the other side is bradycardia. So when your heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, you will have what we call bradycardia. Again, make sure that the patient is on a cardiac monitor or at least do a 12 lead ECG. And the blood pressure again is very, very important. It helps you guide whether you have got time to seek help or you need to act immediately. And lastly, again, getting out early is one of the important things you need to do. So what are the differentials for bradycardia? So it could be sinus, you might see sinus bradycardia, just as P waves with a slow heart rate, or you might see AV block. So I'm not gonna go through the different types of AV block, but these are the different types of AV block. So you've got first degree, your second degree, and your third degree. So all these are causes of uh, bradycardia, and you can only see this by doing an ECG, which is why a 12 lead ECG is very, very important when you see a patient with bradycardia. Again, identifying the underlying cause is another important thing to do when you see a patient with bradycardia. So especially in sinus bradycardia, there could be the patient with hypothermic, the patient with hypothyroidism, or there may be some other electrolyte disturbances that might making, uh, make the heart rate a little bit slow, or maybe it's the medication they've been taking. And so all these are important causes of bradycardia and we should try and reverse it because these might be the reason why the patient is presenting. Again, drugs. We can use different drugs to try and treat bradycardia and it's all on the ALLS algorithm. And that is mainly like drugs like atropine or um, uh, isoprenaline infusion. And these will be instigated if their patient is showing evidence of compromise. Lastly, the mainstay treatment for bradyarrhythmias will be pacing. So pacemaker, either temporary to tie the patient across or permanent pacing will be important to help prevent future presentation or collapses or fainting episodes where they might injure themselves. Okay, so those are the kind of two common presentations in, um, in cardiology with, uh, with regards to emergency. So your tachycardias and bradycardia. Has anyone got any questions before I move on to chest pain? Um, there's quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you want to address them at the end. I don't know if you can have a quick look. Let me have a look to see if it's related. Uh, I might need, let me try and stop sharing for a bit and then I'll go on to the chat. Let's see. 
Uh, oh, there's quite a lot. <laughs> there's quite a lot of questions. So um, I think the f I'm gonna skip the first few because it's about troponins. So I'll, I'll talk about it once I've done the chest pain talk. Uh, let's go down to the next one. So first troponin, second one is about BMP, which is troponin again. We'll skip that. Skip that. Um, beta block. Okay, so there is a beta blocker one. So it says, which beta blockers are most favorable in those with peripheral vascular disease? So in the bivalo with vasodilatory attributes, in patient peripheral artery disease, a refractory and refractory hypertension, what features would alert you to investigate for renal artery stenosis and caution you against RAS blockade? And how would you check the urine? How would checking the urine albumin creatine ratios modify your management plan? So that, that is a quite a, Complex questions to be fair, but uh, yeah, so let's start with uh, beta blockers used in peripheral vascular disease. Yes, nabivalol has vasodilatory attributes, so it could be used. Uh, most, uh, I think some beta blockers such as bisoprolol, which we commonly use, is not absolutely contraindicated, but there are some patients that get issues with uh, Raynaud's and, and peripheral uh, vasospasm when they have beta blockers. So nabivalol could potentially be an option. Um, next is the one investigating for renal artery stenosis. I think most of the time we try and investigate for renal artery stenosis in young patients with hypertension. So because those patients are normally the ones with uh, uh, secondary causes to the hypertension, um, less likely to be essential hypertension, but it could be. So those young patients are the ones that that I normally investigate for uh, with for any other secondary causes. Um, lastly, urine albumin creatinine ratio. It, it doesn't really change the management plan, but it guides you towards whether they've got end organ damage or some diabetic uh, uh, nephropathy with regards to when you check uh, albumin creatinine ratios, because it can tell you that there's been some protein leakage through the renal system. Uh, next question is, Carvedilol, the best beta blocker, even in asthmatic elderly. Yes, Carvedilol is pretty selective, uh, as, as in is a beta 2 uh, selective agonist and uh, antagonist. So um, it's one that we use quite often. Very rarely you see um, reactions to it. But if you do, you can try something else that is less selective like Carvedilol. But most of the time, beat by Sopralol, I've not had issues with it. Um, in asthmatics, especially brito asthmatics, I'll be quite careful with using uh, by Sopralol. And normally you can try different medications like Verapamil or you know, some other calcium channel blocker instead. And I think the last one is, is Nabivalol first choice in the elderly or can they continue on any beta blocker? I think any beta blocker again is uh, bisoprolol is the one that I always go for. Um, what degree of sinus bradycardia would you consider pathological in athletes? How low is too slow? There, there really isn't any cutoff to how slow the heart rate is. If, if it's a sinus bradycardia, you can, you can see it in, in, in athletes. Normally they can go down, to, I've seen it go down to lower than 30 and, and they are fine with it. As long as, long as they have um, uh, cardiac output or, 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 or hold, they hold their blood pressure with the heart rate, then it should be fine and they're asymptomatic. Uh, very rarely we can ask them to detrain and you might see the heart rate build back up again because obviously in athletes, you don't really want to put a pacemaker in when they are very young because there'll be a lot of box changes and things, especially if they, have, if they are involved in contact sports because it's, it can be quite dangerous with the pacemaker in, in place. So most of the time we, we, these patients don't need any treatment unless they are really symptomatic. And if they are symptomatic, we'll ask them to detrain first and get to see whether the heart rate picks back up. Uh, in syncopal patients with palpitations, what additional features should prompt an ECG analysis for Brugada? Fine, yeah. So I think this is, as I think in, in patients with family history, um, if you have any doubt in their ECG, especially when they have syncope palpitation, they should get uh, at least a 24-hour monitor. Most of the time nowadays, they get a loop recorder 
to keep an eye on the heart rhythm for a much longer time because it's very easy to miss uh, subtle changes. Um, ECG features within within uh, Brugada, I mean, right bundle branch block is one of the commonest one. Obviously, you've got your typical Brugada with the, S, uh, the concave ST, and sometimes you can put your V1, V2 lead one space higher, and you might see that change is a little bit more prominent. And then lastly, if a tachycardic hypertensive patient has left atrial dilatation and complaints of intermittent palpitation, could levothyroxin precipitate AF? Um, unless they are over replaced, levothyroxine don't really precipitate the AF. If they are not, if, if their levothyroxine dose is the right dose, you can normally see it precipitate AF. But if they have left atrial dilatation, they are more prone to having AF anyway. So it might just be that they have underlying atrial fibrillation that just comes on and off. And the treatment will be the same as normal AF. So you just treat it like with beta blockers and make sure they're on anticoagulation if need be. Okay, so I think that's all the kind of heart rhythm related questions. So let me move on to the next one. Am I screen sharing? Let me try that. I think I've got the wrong one. Do you see that now? Yes, I can see it. Awesome. Great. So let's move on to the next one, which will be chest pain. So again, I think after you sort out tachycardia and, and bradycardia, those are the kind of the two emergency emergencies that you need to deal with when a when, when patient presents. Uh, or, or, or if you get called to the ward to see these patients, they are the ones that you need to act quite quickly. And the third thing that you need to act quickly will be chest pain. So it could be something very benign, such as musculoskeletal, or it could be something really massive, like an SD elevation MI or even a dissection. So having it when a patient presents or at least complains of acute chest pain, it is very, very important to assess them as early as possible, okay? And most of the time, through the history and doing a basic ABCD assessment, you can have a rough idea of whether this is something you need to be really, really serious and deal with it then and there, or you've got time to do an ECG and reassess after some blood tests and things like that. So always check if they are currently having pain because having ongoing pain especially if it's cardiac, then it's a very bad sign. And then um, if they are having current pain or they're half currently having the pain when you're talking to them, get an ECG immediately because it could be something imminent. As I said, clue is in the history. So obviously as a cardiologist, the most important thing that we like everyone to know how to manage is ACS. So ACS or acute coronary syndrome is the umbrella term for uh, unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and ST elevation myocardial infarction. So as, as, this is as opposed to chronic coronary syndrome, which is in the past called stable angina. So the differentiation between the different types of ACS is by uh, the biomarker and ECG. So in patients with chest pain and a raised troponin, it will be either an NSTEMI or STEMI depending on their ECG changes. In patients with chest pain at rest without troponin rise, it will be an unstable angina. Obviously, they need to be cardiac chest pain, which we'll talk about in a bit. And obviously, patients who only have chest pain when they exert themselves Will, go, will fall under the umbrella of chronic coronary syndrome or stable angina. So um, let's talk a little bit about what is typical versus atypical versus non-cardiac kind of chest pain. So as I said, the history is the key to diagnosing chest pain or ACS. Um, the most of the time, patients complain of constricting discomfort in the front of the chest 
in the neck, shoulder, jaw, or arms, and normally radiates down the left arm. Obviously, there are patients that present with atypical sounding chest pain that is not the classic description, which falls out with this category, and they will fall under the atypical chest pain category. And some patients, most of the time, these are precipitated by physical exertion, okay? So if you think about it, patients with uh, narrowing their coronary arteries, when they exert themselves, the heart needs a little bit more blood, needs a little bit more oxygen. And because the arteries are narrowed, they can't get enough supply to get this warning signs of chest pain. So normally it's precipitated by physical exertion. And then it's normally relieved by rest. So once they exert themselves and they sit down, the, the pain will go away within five minutes. Or if they use their GTN spray, they will go away within five minutes. So this is your kind of your typical chest pain if you have three out of three uh, ticked off when you get a history. When you have two out of three, it will be atypical. When you have one or nothing out of three, then it's normally classed as non-cardiac chest pain. Obviously, all this is more of a historical description. We always look at all the cardiovascular risk factors, which we know about, because these will help you risk stratify your patient a little bit better. So a patient who has previous MI is a big red light. Patient with family history, especially a premature coronary artery disease, when they have a family with heart attacks or bypasses or PCIs below the age of 65, you need to red flag them. Patient who are smoker, diabetics, hypertension, dyslipidemia, those are common things that make you think that this is more likely to be a cardiac type, cardiac sounding chest pain than other. And it will take a lot to try and not investigate these patients further. So common ECG changes which you see in um, chest pains and that's why you need to do that, which is why the 12 lead ECG is one of the most important uh, investigation to start with, would be SC elevation. So when you see this on an ECG, it should be a primary PCI. So it should be activated immediately because when they have these changes, it means that their uh, heart is undergoing severe ischemia and the only treatment to save the heart muscles would be to start to bring them to the cath lab and open up the arteries with uh, stents. Other possible changes are what we see as ST depression. So you can see here, there's some quite a deep ST depression over here, and here as well, so the lateral leads. And then other things would be like T-wave inversion. So you can see here, there's some deep T-wave inversions on this side. And then some patients have what we call biphasic T wave. So you can see the T wave going up and then coming back down again. So these are, could be signs of ischemia. And it all depends on which region of the ECG is pointing towards and it guides us as to where the culprit vessels might be. So I won't go in deep into the ECG, but know the ECG well so that you can map out which region it might be affected and it will help you guide whether these ECG changes are, are something concerning or not. So what are the common investigations that we should do? As, as I said, ECG is very important. It's the one of the very first thing we should be doing in patients with chest pain. Other things would be mainly to look at other differentials, uh, which could be the reason why the patient is having chest pain. So um, imaging, chest X-ray, it's kind of the basic thing you should be doing, especially in young patients who've got sudden onset chest pain and they've got a chest that sounds silent. That might be a spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, other things like CT will be useful to rule out PE and also to rule out dissection. Lastly, uh, blood test is another way to find out why the patient is having chest pain. Could he have a chest infection? Could it be anemia causing angina or anemia causing chest pain symptoms? Could it be someone with uh, troponin rise and ACS? Or could it, and then you can look at other, if you're thinking further ahead, you'll be looking at other risk modification for these patients. So checking the HbA1c and lipid profile will be very important to try and risk stratify and modify these patients in the future. So this is the 
2020 ESC guideline on uh, chest pain at the front door. So nowadays, I'm not sure which, obviously it depends on which hospital, every hospital has their own policy, but the rapid rule out or rule in kind of troponin is where we are going at the moment. So you do a first troponin when a patient comes in and then depending on the results, you can do a subsequent troponin either in an hour or more commonly in three hours. And within there, it will help you decide whether the patient should come into hospital or could be, could be saved to discharge, okay? So this, this is kind of where most hospitals, hospitals will be headed towards where they have the zero, hour, or zero one hour rule out uh, troponin test to try and improve the flow of patients from uh, emergency department. So what are the important differentials for non-traumatic chest pain? So non-traumatic chest pain can have a lot of differentials. The four big ones which I've highlighted here are kind of the big red flags to rule out in the, at the start. I split them into different sections so that, because the treatment is very different in all these uh, uh, presentations. So in ACS and pulmonary embolism, treatment will be anticoagulation and antithrombotic medications. The, in the aortic dissection, they will need surgery. Whereas in the pneumothorax, they will need decompression. So imagine if you see a patient who has a dissection and you, you think that you treat the patient as ACS or PE, it will make the dissection worse because the anticoagulation will, worsening, will worsen the bleeding and make them at high risk for surgery when they really needed it. So having, having these differentials at the back of your mind before you start treating the patient is very important. So how, how do you know which patients would have what reason for, for their chest pain? So again, the important bits and pieces are the description of the pain. So in the, I've, I've highlighted these four different uh, big differentials for chest pain and uh, the four different um, description are over here. So obviously the ACS ones are normally central crushing, it's heavy or tightness and normally it radiates up the jaw and to the left arm. Whereas the pulmonary embolism are normally pleuritic sounding and more commonly associated with shortness of breath. Dissection is normally a tearing and, and a central pain that radiates to the back, whereas pneumothorax is normally one-sided unilateral and it could be a sharp kind of pain. Um, the medical history will be the next part that helps guide you as to kind of risk stratify each patient. So, um, patients with cardiovascular risk factors and family history of ischemic heart disease, you think you shape your mind towards more the ACS pathway. Uh, in patients with recent surgery or has immobilization or has a clotting disorder or even malignancy, you were thinking more like PE, whereas patients with hypertension or very severe hypertension and previous aortopathy, you might think about dissection and normal pneumothorax, there are patients with no lung disease or younger patients that are more likely to be pneumothorax. Examination-wise, it's normally very unremarkable in ACS and PE. You might not find anything listening to the chest or listening to the heart. In um, dissection, you might hear diastolic murmur from the severe aortic regurgitation, or you might hear, um, you, you might, when you measure the blood pressure, there might be a difference between the blood pressure from the left and the right side. Uh, in pneumothorax, obviously you, will, you might see tracheal deviation if it's uh, uh, tension, and then you, there might be a reduced breath sound or no breath sounds on the side where the pneumothorax is. ECG wise, again, we've discussed this, ACS will have STOT of changes. PE, you might see just most of the time you only see sinus tachycardia, but sometimes you might see the classical S1Q3, T3 kind of findings on the ECG. Dissection and pneumothorax normally has no specific findings on the ECGs. And as I said, the management is very different, which is why it's very, very important to know which diagnosis it is before you think about treating the patient. So um, up next, I've got cases. So before I move on to the cases, 
let me just go back to the uh let me stop let me stop sharing and then i'll go back to the questions so i think now that we've done uh chest pain i can go through the first few questions we talked which talks about chest pain stuff so um firstly how does renal dysfunction affect the reliability of troponin levels in mi diagnosis and when would you check the CKMB concentrations in patients with classic ACS symptoms but normal ECG? So, uh, of a uh, patient with renal dysfunction, we normally see a slightly higher level of troponins. But in if their patient does have acute coronary syndrome, you will see the delta change in the troponin. So there will be a rise or fall in the troponin depending on what point of the blood test was taken. Um, obviously you wouldn't expect the troponin to be very, very, very high. So if they're in the thousands, always think that, that, that there is a potential that the heart, there's something wrong or likely to be ACS. Um, other things, uh, the other question was about CKMB. Uh, it's kind of been phased out nowadays with CKMB. We don't check it as routinely as when we first had it because troponin is much more sensitive and much more specific towards cardiac um, uh, diagnosis. Um, we do check it sometimes. I think the last time where I checked it was to, uh, when patients who has a chronically raised troponin, uh, with, which we cannot find a cause for, and you do a CKMB and they found that it's normal because some patients do, uh, because of the way the troponin assay works, some patients have a raised troponin just because of the reactivity that that they have towards the essay. So those are kind of very rare cases where we check CKMB. Uh, the next question is, in a hypertensive smoker with COPD and history of infective endocarditis, how would you differentiate acute cardiac dyspnea from a more pulmonary etiology, especially when comorbidities can keep you falsely elevated and you probe BNP and troponin levels? I think that it, it, that, that is a very difficult question because most of the time these patients do come in with a mixture of both and and there may never be a way you can differentiate between the two without imaging or without um, blood tests. As mentioned, if they have a very, very significantly raised troponin, then it will make you point towards more cardiac kind of issues or very, very raised ND pro BMP it might mean that they have more decompensated heart failure than, than rather, rather than just a infective exacerbation of their COPD. Uh, otherwise, if they have raised inflammatory markers and, and X-ray changes of, of infection, it will point you more towards infective exacerbation than heart failure. So, so you, you need to get clues from different uh, areas of the patient and, and, and with your investigations help guide you towards the treatment. Um, I think the next one would be this one. How does chronic subacute PE affect cardiac biomarker levels? And can infection induced AF falsely elevate antipro BNP troponin? Okay, uh, let's start with the chronic subacute PE. So, um, in patients with subacute PE, they can have a raised troponin. And normally, when patients have a raised troponin with PE, is quite a bad sign because it means that the heart is under strain and, and, and there's some uh, myocardial ischemia, which is a bad sign. Um, and then the second one was, can infection induce AF falsely elevate antibro BMP and troponin levels? Yes, it definitely can. Um, in patients with AF, they can have what we call a type 2 MI, where their heart rate goes a little bit too fast and then they suffer from ischemia and, and that can increase their troponin levels. And obviously when, when they have um, this, the, the, the infection is actually the cause of, of the AF going fast and thereby increasing troponin levels. And if you use troponin as a biomarker, you might see that um, it's a sign, it's a, basically troponin is a prognostic, it's a poor prognostic marker in patients with raised troponin versus patients without raised troponin with the same diagnosis, they tend to do worse than, 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 than the counterparts without the raised troponin. So yeah, having a raised troponin is not a good thing. Uh, I think the next few things would be, 
how what when would you resort to using positive anotropic treatment in cardiogenic shock and what is the adverse electrolytic risk of cardiac rupture i think um obviously it's quite advanced uh, normally in patients with cardiogenic shock shock the only way you can treat them is a positive anotrope when you can't get their blood pressure up and and that will be the only treatment that you have um obviously in 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 more advanced centers where you have lvad and and, and uh, circulatory support for the patients then it's slightly different but anywhere else where you have buying time to keep the patient alive the inotrope will be the only way to treat them and then next is uh, is there a correlation between d dimer levels and right ventricular failure uh, and can pro BMP be normal range in patients with predominantly right heart failure? So I don't, I'm not sure about this, but I don't think there is a correlation between D dimer and right ventricular failure. You will see a D, the D dimer is a, is, is a breakdown product of uh, coagulation and clotting. So, so when you have pulmonary embolism, you will see a raised D dimer. And, and that might just be the reason for the raised D dimer. And there's no relation between the levels and the amount of right heart failure. And then uh, can pro-BMP be normal range in patients with predominant right heart failure? Uh, yes, it can be. So pro-BMP is a marker of how overloaded the patient is, technically, because the more stretched your, your atria is, the more uh, pro-BMP you will have. And so if you manage to offload the patient to dryness, the pro-BMP should start to come down. So yeah, they can, they can be normal range. How atypical could cardiac acute ACS chest pain present in older diabetic lady who has neuropathy? Uh, on such not specific critical symptoms, more likely to be missed or falsely negatively dismissed. Yes, so I think this, this is one of the big things that we're trying to um, look into, especially uh, in women, because women tend to present with more atypical chest pains than men. And, and it's something that, uh, everyone or at least in the cardiology field we are we are trying to avoid having the stereotypical chest pain as, as the cause or as the only way you diagnose the patient and which is why having a background of the patient is very useful because having the background will help you guide how risky it is so you risk stratify the patient based on is the patient diabetic is the patient has the patient got high blood pressure has the patient got has uh, dyslipidemia and all these different things will help you um, risk stratify the patient so you know whether you can dismiss this chest pain or not and whether you should investigate the patient further um let's go on i think we've answered that da, da. i think the last one is if the patient has diabetes for coronary vascularization, would you prefer to do cabbage instead of PCI? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, normally it depends on the, firstly, it depends on the location of the uh, disease and, 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 and um, whether it's amenable to PCI. And obviously the other thing is what the patient's preference is. If both options are the same, then it should, uh, with regards to it's it's safe it, it's safe to do either PCI or bypass, then it should be a patient's kind of led choice. The patient should be choosing whichever that they want to do, depending on what their lifestyle is like. Um, but for longevity wise, bypass surgery normally lasts best, lasts longer than PCI, because we know that patients with diabetes, especially if they are poorly controlled they might have to come back for further interventions after the first PCI. And, and at, at some point, once we've stented all the vessels to the point where we can't put any stents anymore, then bypass surgery might be the only option, uh, which is why in patients, especially in young, young, younger patients who has diabetes, bypass surgery is kind of the preferred option, unless the patient strongly feels that PCI is what they want. Okay. So I think that is all the questions that we have. So let me go back to sharing the screen again. There we go. Okay, so let's move on to the case now. I might not be able to see the chat as I move. So 
Or at least I can try. I don't know whether I can see the chat. Oh, there we go. I got it open now. Good. So let's go on. So uh, I'm going to go through three cases. So I'll try to be as interactive or <laughs> try to be as interactive as possible. Uh, or just hopefully you will learn something through the previous talk that I have. So let's start with patient number one. So patient one is a 75 year old man in the coronary care unit. So the nurses has just bleeped you saying, oh, this gentleman is complaining of some palpitations and is feeling very dizzy. Would you mind uh, coming to see this patient? So the first thing I will ask is, you've, gone to, you've arrived in CCU and what is the very first thing you would do? So would you do an ECG? Would you go and see the patient and do an ABCDE? Would you ask the nurses for a set of observations or ask the nurses what the observations were? Or are you just gonna look at the patient's notes or would you just call for help straight away? Okay, I've got an A, ECG, B, some, someone's going for E, <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> Okay, so it could be AF, lots of A and Bs, very good. Good, so yeah, so I think A and B is probably what I would do first. Obviously I would do them together. So first thing, obviously will, the more important thing would be to go and see the patient. So do your ABCD assessment. So you start by going, you start by walking to the patient and then you go into the room and then say, okay, the patient is talking to you, the airway is patent. And then you measure the respiratory rate. It was, he's breathing a little bit fast, respiratory rate of 30. His sets was about 89% on room air. And as you listen to the chest, you hear some crackles at the bases. So just as you were about to move on to C, the patient collapsed and falls to the back of the bed. So what would you do next? <laughs> so you start by giving some oxygen. Yep. And you're calling for help. Yep. The registrar is on the way. So you've done your AB assessment. Yep. So someone's calling code blue. So that will be a cardiac arrest call or at least, at least something, uh, an emergency call to get everyone in here. So the next thing I would probably do if I see a patient collapse in front of me, Good, so reassess, yes, that's what you call, that's the, that's the important thing is to reassess. Once the situation change, you should be reassessing the patient. So the patient is talking to you initially and now the patient's collapsed onto the bed. So you reassess the patient. So you do your ABC assessment, so check for response. So once you're checking for response, you find that, oh my God, the patient has no signs of life. They can't feel your pulse, there's no breathing. You start some chest compression and you attach pads and defibrillator on the patient as you're doing it. Obviously, you, the nurses are gone to make the cardiac arrest call, so the team will be coming soon. And then once you put the pads on, this is what you see. What should you do next? So can anyone tell me what rhythm this is? Yep, so someone's in chest compression. So we are, we are doing chest compression now. And someone said rate control, ventricular tachyarrhythmia, broad complex tachy, good. Yeah, so broad complex decompensation, good. So yeah, so this is what we call a broad complex tachycardia, isn't it? So we mentioned this before, broad complex with decompensation because there's no signs of life. What's the, next, what's the treatment for this? Yes, shock. Correct. So you've got pads on, you've got, you've, you've got this rhythm. The thing you need to do now is to charge up the defibrillator, make sure everyone is clear and shock the patient. So this is one of the shockable rhythms within your ALS. So very important uh, things to look at is the two shockable rhythms that we've got on our ALS algorithm, pulses VT, uh, VF, which this patient has. So 
fibrillating waves, you should be shocking the patient. Okay, so you, you press your button and this is what you get. Okay. So what would you do next now that you've shocked a patient once? And you got this rhythm back. Obviously the cardiac arrest team is on the way. They're stuck in a lift. Good, reassess. Well done. So yeah, someone mentioned, <laughs> someone mentioned resume chest compression. That it's something you should be thinking about, but once you've got a potential viable rhythm, you should be reassessing the patient because the patient might have output back already. And then, uh, so you reassess the patient. So continue if you're A, B, C, D, E. So this, you start with, go back to A again. So the patient's airway is patent, he's breathing well, his respiratory rate is 40. Obviously he's got a non-rebreathing mass now, sets of 99%. And again, chest has some crackles at the bases. His heart rate is now 98 beats per minute. Your blood pressure rate is reasonable at 103. Very cold peripherally, CRT of three seconds. And he's a little bit confused when he's talking to you, but he's just talking away and pupils are equal reactive. And when you feel tummy soft and non-tender, there is no evidence of any external bleeding and things like that. So what caused this decompensation? So very important thing is to know the reversible causes of VT and VF. This will be in your ALS algorithm. So is one of the things that you need to know at the back of your mind when you're doing your ALS training and getting your certification. So the four H's and four T's are very, very important because these are life-saving things that you can do to a patient to try and get them out of the arrhythmias that they have. So common things are common, and these are the common ones that we normally see that we can reverse. So um, obviously the patient was slightly hypoxic when you first saw the patient with our 89%. So some oxygen would have helped reverse that. We didn't check the temperature of the patient. So uh, that wasn't, obviously that wasn't part of the, the case. Other things could be hypovolemia. The patient might be hypotensive, severely hypotensive. Electrolyte disturbances, another one. We don't know about this patient because we haven't checked it. Uh, Temponade, less likely, but it's a potential that you need to think about, especially in patients who presented after trauma. Uh, tension pneumothorax is not likely in this patient because his chest was, was, you could hear air entry and there was crackles at the basis. Uh, other things like toxins, if the patient has been given medications which you haven't checked. And also he's in CCU, so thrombosis is another big thing potentially as the cause of his VF or VT. So that was, I. I'll stop the case there because I didn't want to move on because uh, I don't want to go down the route of going ACS treatment and stuff. So this shows you that tachyarrhythmias can be very dangerous. But if you think about it logically, if there is a patient with broad complex tachycardia and has compromise, the only treatment is shocking them. So get a rest him and then shock the patient. Okay, so we'll move on to patient two. Uh, so patient two is a... 86 year old female who presented after the fall in a residential home. The nurse has asked you to come and see the patient because she appears unresponsive. So as you get into the ward, what is the first thing you would do? So A, E, C, G, D, do an A, B, C, D, E, C, observations, D, look at the patient's notes, E, ask for help. Good, lots of Bs, that's good. So yeah, the very first thing could be just look at the patient because by looking at the patient, you will know, you'll get a lot of information and you will kind of, it will guide you to the next step. So doing an ABCD, so you go over, spoke to the patient. Actually, she's not completely obtunded. She could talk to you, although she sounds a little bit confused. Um, her respiratory is 22, SATS is 92% on room air. Again, some crackles at the basis, her heart rate, as you feel it, it's about 40 beats per minute. With a blood pressure of 97 over 53. She's quite cold peripherally, and you know, note that she has already got venous excess. Uh, she's talking to you. Pupils are equal and reactive. I forgot to put here, but her temperature is normal. Her BMS is 6.1. 6 
There is evidence of bilateral pitting edema, and obviously there's some chronic venous changes with some ulcers that is healthy, and there's no signs of external bleeding. Okay, so what would you do next? Now that you've done your ABCDE assessment. So I'll show you the options again. So ECG, obviously you've done your ABCDE observations, look at the patient's notes, or ask for help. So we've got an elderly lady whose heart rate is about 40 and a little bit confused, but blood pressure is holding. Blood pressure is about 90 something systolic. Good. Yeah, so A and D is what I would do. It's definitely. So do an ECG. So can anyone tell me what this ECG shows? Good, someone's measuring heart block. Yeah, heart block. So what type of heart block is this? We've got AV block, someone's measuring third degree. Three, two, one. Four, two, one. So yeah, so this is what we call complete heart block. So there is AV dissociation. So you can see the P waves are all by themselves. This is P, 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 P. And the QRS are all by themselves as well. So there, there's, no, there's no relationship between the P and the QRS. Uh, it means that the atria and the ventricles are not talking to each other. So that's what we call complete heart block, okay? So this is a lady who's got complete heart block now on your ECG. And obviously the patient is quite stable. So you go on and have a look at her notes. So review her notes. This was her entry from uh, coming to hospital. So this was her admission note. So it says, no history of a patient as she appears confused. So when the SHO saw the patient, they said she was found on the floor and seems to have fallen out of bed and apparently has been complaining of dizziness and the GP has reviewed the patient, noted high blood pressure and started on some antihypertensives. Medication-wise, she's on donepazil for, for dementia, she's on simvastatin, she's got long-term UTI and some hypertension that started on lotopine recently. And non-smoker, so social history wise, she's pretty okay. Good, okay, so what is your diagnosis then? What is the reason for this patient's fall? Is, is it because she's fallen and why she's confused because she's had a bleed in the brain? Is it because the GP started her on some amlodipine and now she's got postural hypotension, that's why she's having falls? Is this a cardi what we call cardiogenic syncope? Or is it just because she's got UTI and she's a little bit confused? That's why she's not making sense. So I've got C. See, yeah, so you got the idea. So this is a patient, an elderly patient with complete heart block. It, it, this, uh, this is all cardiogenic, unless you can prove it otherwise. So yeah, so now that you know that this patient has had a fall and, and, and has complete heart block, what would you do now? So you've assessed the patient, you've done all the right things, ECG, looked at the history and you think, okay, this patient has a fall and is like, is, is unwell because of a slow heart rate. So you might need pacing, that's absolutely correct. External pacing, pacing, good, yeah. So the treatment for this patient is a pacemaker. So what I would do as a junior, when I first start, when I see this patient would be to let one of the registrars know, I've got basically, uh, hand over to the to registrar and ask for some advice as to what you would do. So most of the time, this patient will need a monitored bed. Okay, so she needs she her heart needs to be monitored because complete heart block is very high risk of going into a systole, and and it can be very dangerous. So we need to know what's going on with the heart rhythm all the time. So they need a monitored bed, and ensure that the patient has a defibrillator 
slash external pacing machine next to her and the pads should be on so that it can pace her if it needs be. And also one reminder here is make sure that the leads are attached to the patient so that it, it, it will pace. And when you need emergency pacing, you don't need to fiddle about looking for the leads because it can't, the external pacemaker can't pace without the three leads to help it recognize the rhythm. And then obviously the, the, the more permanent solution would be to get cardiology input for potentially a pacemaker, or you can, if she's unwell, it may be a temporary wire depending on the location. And other things that you can consider in an emergency setting would be drugs like atropine, isoprenaline or adrenaline. So this is your adult bradycardia algorithm within your ALS. Um, in her case, she's not compromised as of yet. So I wouldn't go down the route of needing, uh, putting her through this uh, drugs because they can be very uh, bad for the patient or the patient can have very bad side effects from it. Uh, so it will be someone that I will probably speak to cardiology quite early on and they will can try and get pacemaker in as soon as possible. Good, so that's bradycardia. So the last one, so following the theme of what we've talked about, will be chest pain then. So I've got a 70 year old lady who presented with chest pain and palpitations. So the nurse has asked you to come and see this patient because you're now working in the ED and the patient has come in with chest pain and palpitation. What would you do first? So same old option, same options again. This is not a trick question. Yep. <laughs> so everyone knows. It's B. So assess the patient first. Go and see the patient. Okay. So again, A, B, C, D, E, A, the patient's talking to you. Sounds a little bit confused. B, respiratory rate of 20, sets night 6%. There's some crackles on the left base. C, her heart rate is about 131. Blood pressure is 108 over 73. And preferably a little bit cold. The nurse has, has obtained IV access and the bloods have been sent. D, the patient is verbal and there's no neurological sign that you can find. And E, nothing much to find besides some dry oral mucosa. So what would you do next? ECG. Great. So you've asked for an ECG. I will give you an ECG. So what does the ECG show? Good. I see AF. Good. Yeah. So this patient ECG is showing AF. Yeah, so you can't see any obvious P waves and it's what we call irregularly irregular. Okay, so as once the ECG has been done and you looked at it, you got your blood results back. So this is the blood result that we got back. So we've done a venous gas quite diligently and it's shown nothing much bad besides a lactate of 2.7. Uh, her other venous bloods are back as well and we've got hemoglobin of 79 white cell is 17.5, um, a little bit urea 18, creatinine 151, which you don't have a baseline for. CRP is 102. Her first troponium was 88, and the other electrolytes are normal, and her thyroid function is normal. So with, with this picture, with the examination findings that you have, with crackles and some dry oral mucosa with some cold peripheries and the ECG of AF, what is your diagnosis? Why is this patient presenting with chest pain and palpitations? I've got sepsis. Good, sepsis causing AF. So yeah, so that is the most likely cause because you've got a patient with left basal crackles, potentially an infection, 
blood in uh, blood consistent with uh, an infection with raised, raised inflammatory markers and raised lactate, which is a bad sign. So yeah, so but possibly the patient has a less sided pneumonia. And also, if you look at her blood, she's, she looks quite dry with possibly an AKI. Obviously, as I say, I don't have a baseline, but with a urea of 18 and credit 151, it's likely that she has some sort of AKI. And the findings of being dry and peripherally shut down, it's a sign that she's, she, she's probably a little bit on the drier side. And then all this has caused what we call a type 2 MI, second rooted infection, precipitated by having the fast AF and on the background of having anemia. So, which is we to explain why her troponin is the first troponin is raised. Okay. So, this is not what we call an AC or a, a, a primary ACS where you have a clot in the, in, in the coronary artery. This is more like there is a uh, imbalance between the supply and demand of oxygen to the cardiac myocytes. So the treatment for her would be antibiotics. So you treat the underlying cause. So give her antibiotics for the infection. She will need some IV fluids for the AKI and get a blood pressure up a little bit better. And that might slow down her heart rate. She, at some point, you need to investigate why she's so anemic and look at the GP nodes. And maybe there's been some previous investigation and treat the anemia if need be. And then once she's stabilized, you can think about beta blockers for her AF if she's still going a little bit fast. And think about anticoagulation for stroke prevention because of a child's vascular will be raised. Okay, so hopefully that was useful. So in summary, um, treating cardiac emergencies is fairly straightforward. So always stay calm, the most important thing so that you can think straight, do the basics right, get your ABCD assessment appropriately, get an ECG, get help early, and if there's any compromise, any signs of compromise, shocking is most likely the treatment of choice. And find and treat the underlying cause in patients with cardiac uh, decompensation, or at least cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, that's about it. Cool, so any questions? Um, there are two new questions through the chat, if you have a look through that. Let me um, scroll through them. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, I've also posted the feedback link a couple of times in the chat. Uh, if you guys make sure to fill that out, uh, these talks are free, it's the only thing we ask for. Uh, it helps us make things better. And also it's the only way I can give you your certificates. So please do fill those in as well. Um, Great. So let me go through the question. I think there's two of them, isn't it? So first one is of the up to 10% approximate acute type A dissection of patients who are deemed unfit for open surgical repair, what proportion may be eligible for endovascular ascending aorta repair and how the outcomes compare to conventional invasive management? Um, that, 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 <laughs> that is out with my specialty, unfortunately. It's more for the vascular surgeon. But I, I, I suspect if, if they can, I think endovascular repair might be fairly difficult for, for, for an acute dissection because of everything else is going on. And if they are unfit for open surgery, endovascular repair might not be eligible, uh, might not be the right option for them anyway. I, well, I'm not sure about that. There's not something that I always see. I see a lot. Um, the next thing is, what is the risk of spontaneous rupture of lower esophagus during TOE? and our survivors of Bullhouse syndrome precluded from TOE. I don't think that is a uh, absolute contraindication. Obviously, we need, we, need, we need to explain the risk to the patient. And, and the quoted risk for spontaneous rupture is about one, less than 1% in patients uh, where, where we consent for TOE. And lastly, can you talk a little bit about sickle cell and any pearls in recognizing sickle cell crisis? Oh. Oh, that is something that is out with my specialty as well. But uh, yeah, so sickle cell, I suspect it will be, it's all this looking at um, whether they've got a history of sickle cell anemia, firstly. And secondly, it would be 
they normally present with very weird pains and it, it, they can have chest pain, arm pain, leg pain, and, and potentially that might be something that you might see in patients with sickle cell. Uh, but it's not, it's not something that I see very commonly. How to assess silent MI in diabetics. Um, so again, this is very important, is the risk stratification for, for patients with uh, medical history that is consists of putting them at higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So assessing silent MI would be, obviously your history won't be there, but you might have uh, other things that will help guide you, such as biomarkers or blood tests, looking at troponins, ECGs, and if all else fails, then you can go on to more advanced things like imaging with echocardiogram, CT coronary angiogram, or even, or even um, uh, stress echocardiogram and MRI to assess for ischemia in patients who doesn't have chest pain and you are very uh, suspicious of uh, coronary artery disease. Yeah. So I think these are the questions. Any other questions? Hey, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, really, really interesting talk. Uh, we're hoping to upload these talks to YouTube soon. Um, if anyone's got any other questions, um, I, I think Ying's put his details up there and you can also email us if you've got any questions about our talks. Thank you, everyone.